Listen, I, I started, I didn't mean to start a series, but I started talking about temptation and I just kind of run with it. And so this is Run, Force, Run, Part 5. Because <laughs> you guys know I'm so good with these titles. But the title of this message in Run, Force, Run is Running in Neutral. First Corinthians chapter 10, just to catch us up so we get reminded of where I was at. First Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13 says, The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. Let's say, God is faithful. We even sang a song tonight that God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, He will show you a way out so that you can endure. So a few things that we've learned that I'm going to go over here in the next few moments is number one, we've learned that we will all experience temptation. No matter how spiritual you think you are, you're going to be tempted to do something wrong. And if you think you're spiritual, you're going to be tempted to be too prideful. So there's temptation for everybody. Number two, as we've learned, temptation is not the sin. It's the action that becomes the sin. Number three, we don't negotiate with temptation. We run from it. And temptation can be overcome. We've also learned that Satan is the tempter, not God. In James 1, uh, I'm going to only read verses uh, 13 and 14 and 15, I guess. God never tempts us. Temptation comes from our own desires which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So we realize God never tempts us to do wrong or evil. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3-5 through 5 basically talks about our warfare is not physical, it's spiritual. Verse 4, but they are mighty before God for the overthrow and destruction of strongholds. Inasmuch as we refute arguments and theories and reasonings and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the knowledge or the true knowledge of God. And we lead every thought and purpose away captive into the obedience of Christ. That means there's a fight going on, there's a war. You're going to have to make your mind think on the things of Christ, bring your thinking into the obedience and subject of Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. And then God has given us spiritual weapons to fight a spiritual battle in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. We've also learned that temptation comes to destroy us, to cause us to be disobedient, to get us away from God. And that when we might be tempted to compromise our faith. And I talked a lot about that last week, that we might be tempted. One of the temptations is to compromise our faith. Because what goes into our minds will determine who we are. What you put in you determines who you are. And so many give up, give God lip service, don't they? There's no action to their, to their words. In Matthew 15, 8, Jesus said, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And the longer I'm a Christian and the more we get more secular and liberal as a society, the church tends to go that way for some reason because we, we, we have a hard time standing on our beliefs and what the Bible actually teaches, so we just develop our own God, our own idols, whatever it is. And, and I don't know how many people over the years walk up and tell me, I'm a Christian, and then I begin to ask them, do you do Christian things? And I name about two or three, and almost always, always, they'll say, no, I don't do any of that. And I said, so, so you give God a lot of lip service, but there's no action to your faith. And you and I, I mean, Jesus said it. I'm just repeating what he said. I bet he could say to a lot of us, maybe even me, you, you honor me with your lips. But man, your, your hearts are far from me. How do we know that? Because if your heart's with God, that's where your treasure will be, your life will be, your action will be, everything. You, you'll do Christian-like things. You'll want to be around Christian stuff, godly stuff. And so today, the temptation I'm going to talk about is you might be tempted to be spiritually lazy. There's a big difference, a biblical difference, if you would, between being lazy and slothful. Slothful basically means lukewarm, and I'll be defining this throughout this message. Lukewarm, you neglect the Bible, going to church. The result is your hunger for God, your passion for God, serving Him, are no longer a priority. You begin to lose. It begins to wane in your life. And so a lot of us are tempted to be spiritually lazy. Hebrews 6, 12 from the King James, and then I'm going to read it from the New Living, reads this way, that you be not slothful, 
but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Hebrews 6, 12 from the New Living, then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. Instead, you will follow the example of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and endurance. And if you read the Bible at all, this is, this is an endurance race. It's not a sprint. It's a journey. It's a marathon. And you and I got to realize there'll be ups and downs in that marathon. We'll have peaks and we'll have valleys. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You will walk in that valley at some point. But if you know God, we won't fear evil. And so the Bible talks about that you be not slothful. The, the new living breaks it down to dull and indifferent concerning the things of God. Now, laziness is defined as the quality of being unwilling to work or use energy idleness. Now, let me say this as I get into this slothfulness and what it really means from the Greek and what the Bible is trying to tell us, that I realize in this room there's a lot of people who aren't lazy. No one would accuse you of being lazy. You work hard. You go to work, you produce, you take care of your responsibilities. You're not a couch potato. You get out and do something. You want a job. You want to be busy. You find things to do to occupy your time. So you may not be physically lazy. But this is another whole thing, the slothfulness. It's the Greek word nothros. And it means something that is dull, monotonous unexciting, repetitious, lacking in interest, something that is slow and sluggish, or something that has lost its speed or momentum. This something is still moving, but isn't moving with the same velocity and aggressiveness it once had. It has lost the drive, the speed it once possessed. It's like some of us who played sports that now we're older. We talk about the good old days. I used to be able to jump and run, but now I can barely walk. But man, one day. <laughs> this word, therefore, presents the idea of someone who was once zealous about something, but whose zeal has now dissipated, replaced instead by neutrality. So this is talking about a spiritual person that once was on fire for God, wanted to serve God, do whatever God wanted, but now they're not that interested. And then they want to be neutral. Can I tell you something? There is no neutrality or neutral with God. Either you're going forward or you're going backwards. And a lot of people say, well, I'm, I, I'm just not going to say anything. I'm just neutral. No, you're moving the wrong way. There is no neutral. There's a neutral on our stick shift in our cars, but there is no neutral with God. You're either moving with God or you're moving away from God. That's it. Oh, pastor, I'm just holding. There is no holding. You're either going forward or backwards. But these people that are slothful that he's referring to in Hebrews 6, these people have become dull, disinterested. And instead of being on fire for God and standing for God's ways and principles, they just want to be liked. Let's, let's just put it neutral. Let's don't cause any waves. But that's not the way God intended us to be. Northros is like a light that once burned bright and like you could see it, but now it's dull and flickering. It's still, it's still lit, but it doesn't have the same brightness that it once did. See, it's not laziness. It speaks of someone who has lost their excitement, their passion, or conviction about something that once meant a lot to them. A person who has become disinterested and been replaced with a take it or leave it kind of mentality. Why do I care? I just don't care anymore. One person says Hebrews could be translated like this or read like this. Quit being slothful. Quit acting like someone who has lost his or her enthusiasm and excitement and has now sunk into a state of being slow and boring, monotonous, sluggish, dull, or uninterested. I'm reading that thing, and that sounds like some people's marriage. It's boring. you got to add some spice to your life. 
I don't know why I said that. <laughs> but are you relating to this? This is, this is how some of our, uh, us be, this is our spiritual walk. This is, the, this is where we're at spiritually. See, anybody that has trained for a sport or worked out, or if you work out, know that you have to keep pushing past where you've gotten or our body will adapt and consume less energy doing the same exercise all the time. I don't know. I'm not a trainer, but my trainer tells me this. He says, because after a workout, I'm saying, man, I'm exhausted. He said, well, you're always going to be exhausted. He always tells me, he, for a long time, he said, you're in good shape. You're in good shape. I said, well, I'm in good shape. Why do I feel like this? Because I thought if I was in good shape, I would get through a workout and be like, hey, that wasn't bad. I thought that. That's the way I thought. How many of y'all know? What, I was like, hey, I'm in shape. I can handle that. No, it doesn't. He keeps saying, you're in good shape. And then I'm dead, like dying, like call the ambulance type people. <laughs> call Chris Archuleta. Come get me, man. Just no mouth to mouth. There ain't none of that. No resuscitation <laughs> that way. But then one day I said, why do you keep, t-? I finally said to him, why do you keep telling me I'm in shape, man? I can barely get through these workouts. He goes, oh, Pastor, you're never going to get through a workout easy because I'm always making them more difficult. And I said, are you kidding me? And he said, no, you have to keep pushing forward. How many on, how many, do we have any trainers in here, people that do that stuff? Am I telling the truth? Am I te- okay, I'm telling the truth. All right, I'm not lying. It's church. <laughs> so I asked him one day, I said, how long does it take a person to get used to a workout? And he actually told me, one time, you do it one time, if we do it the exact same way the next time, your brain's used to it and you, lose le- you use less energy. So he says he calls it muscle confusion, or really it's brain confusion. So we may do similar exercise, but we do them differently. And they, 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 it just, it's, it's unbelievable how tired I'm looking. I'm like, I should get through this better. So you have to keep pushing forward, and God is always stretching us. He's always moving you forward. And if you just do the same thing over and over again, you will plateau. Are you listening to me? And then you'll be thinking, man, I got such great results for the first month or two months. If it even lasts that long, I don't know. And then you're like, well, I plateaued, man. I lost 10 pounds and now it's like nothing. It's because you're not pushing yourself to go forward. One of the reasons that I work out with a trainer, my wife and I were talking about this the other day, because they always will push me farther than I'm willing to push myself. Because once I work in my own workouts that I do, when I get tired, I'm like, yeah, that's enough. But with him, it's like, no, you got to finish. And so you and I need to understand it's the same way spiritually, that our body can reach a plateau where we don't get the same results as we once got or did get. That's why when we get used to lifting a certain amount of weight, if you're lifting weights and you get used to it, you either have to do it more weight or a lot more repetitions, or your body's just used to it. It's not going to do anything for you. And some people say, well, I I, I got far enough. I just want to hold there. I don't know if you can hold there. I think you begin to digress. And so it's the same way. It's it's the same way spiritually. It's easy to grow comfortable with our spiritual routines. We have stopped stretching our spiritual muscles, if you would. And we just get used to stuff. This is what I do. This is what I do. This is what I do. In fact, so many have gotten so used to it, now they're getting worse and they're in decline because you're either going forward with God or you're going backwards with God. And if we're not careful as Christians, we become spiritually slothful. That we're no longer energized. Does anybody remember when they first got saved? Maybe some of you are just now saved. I can remember when I first got saved. Man, I was on fire for God. I had so much zeal, no wisdom, but I'm like, let's go save the world. (laughs) And I told everybody I know about Jesus, man, Jesus. I didn't even know much about Jesus, but man, I got saved. They said, what's that? I said, I don't know, but it makes me, I feel different. (laughs) And when I got saved, I wanted to be in church. And when they went to church, you know, the the pastor said, hey, you got to usher. I said, okay, because I couldn't get enough of God. Come on. I just wanted to be around God. I'm like, man, this is so exciting. It's so new. I was so passionate. Come on. 
I even wanted to read the Bible. My mom about had a heart attack. Like, what are you reading? The Bible? The what? I wanted to be in church. And back in those days, church was different than it is in these days. Back then, you went Sunday, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? And in between that, you had Bible studies. Come on. And the church service lasted, I'll never forget, three hours. I was thinking about it tonight. I was thinking, God, what did we do for three hours? I mean, we're ready to go home after an hour and 10 minutes. It's like, man, it's been, been a while, man, going over. But if you remember, I, I don't know about you, but I couldn't get enough of God. I just couldn't get enough. And so they said, you got to be an usher. Okay. Then they said, well, we need catchers. And so, so I became a catcher. Not a baseball catcher, but back in the day where I got saved, you caught people. It's a good thing I played baseball for so long, man. I never dropped a person. But I can tell you this, there's been some big old boys that I've looked at the other catcher like, aren't you the head of this? I'm not catching that dude. That dude falls on me. I'm never getting up. Back then, I was 150 pounds soaking wet. Man, there's a boy, 350, ain't nothing. No, dude, don't fall. You're on your own, brother. But you would catch them. You would just like catch them and, you know, so they wouldn't hurt themselves. Then they told me, you know, we need the bathrooms clean. So I cleaned bathrooms. Then they said, we need someone to drive a bus to Portales back in my days in Clovis. We need to pick up college students. So you know what I did? I drove the bus. And by the time I would get home Sunday, I would get home long enough to eat a little something and go back to church for another three hours. And I never remember complaining one bit like, man, this is too much God. It's too much church. I just wanted to be around God. And then, you know, and then they started changing the way I dressed because my dress was jeans. We didn't dress like this back then. They said, you got to wear a suit. I'm like, I don't even have a suit. But I remember the first time I, when my mom finally got me a suit, I said, Mom, I need a suit. She goes, you need a suit? And I said, yeah, I guess I need a suit and tie. I didn't, even, I didn't know how to do any of that. I was in jeans and T-shirts and flip-flops. And on a good day, overalls, man. Anybody remember that? No shirt, just like wearing it. Long hair down to here. It's like, I'm chilling. I remember the first time I wore a suit, I brought a buddy with me, and he goes, and he called me my nickname. He said, what? What are you doing? I said, what do you mean? He goes, you're wearing white athletic socks with a suit. I'm like, is that wrong? He goes, you don't wear that. So I went home and said, Mom, I can't wear white athletic socks with a suit. She's like, well, I'll go get you some dress. I didn't even know what to get. But they told me you had to wear a suit and tie. So I wore a suit and tie. And you know what? I can tell you this. I never complain. It's what the church said. It wasn't like it was sin. So let me take a moment right here to thank all of our ushers. Let me thank them. Uh, yeah. Because what happens to us when we've been in the church a little while, we forget what it's like to come when you don't know anybody or you've never been or you've never been in church. And we asked our ushers if they would wear their shirts every week. And I want to thank you for doing that because here's what you were saying. That we get used to things and we know how things work, but people coming in that are lost or that don't know our church, when you wear that shirt, they have someone they can go to and say, that's a person that's doing something. I need to go to them and, be a, and I can talk to them and maybe get some help or some information. And so, ushers, thank you so much for being willing to do that. Thank you so much for being willing to put Jesus first and not your own. Can I tell you something, guys? I can remember when my wife and I went to church on the move in Tulsa. We would go on Wednesday night. I worked at UPS. We know that. And, I, and sometimes we'd just run into church at the last minute because I was just getting off work and I'd go home. And remember, I had to put on a suit. So I'd take a quick shower and throw on a suit. I'd be tying my tie as I'm going to the church and the head usher would say, I know, you're, I know you're here. I knew you'd make it. So go to section so-and-so. And the only thing that I ever prayed about going into the section was, please, God, please have no mamas with babies. Because if the babies cried in my section, I was responsible going and saying, hey, would you follow me? And some of the mamas were like, no, I ain't following you nowhere. I'm like, well, I'm not really asking. I'm like, would you come out with me? And then you look at Pastor George, and he's like looking. I'm like, please, man, the pastor's going to kill me. Would you please come? 
I didn't say that. So I would pray, oh God, please let all the women with babies go into the other sections with the other ushers. So I knew when I wasn't living too good and I had to go repent is when women showed up with babies. I'm like, oh God, I know I'm in sin. Please forgive me. But what I'm saying is that's the way you dress. We didn't dress like this. Now I like this. My wife has told me in the last little, you know, months or whatever. She said, are you going to church dressed like that? And I said, yeah. She goes, you're kind of relaxed. I said, I like it. Slim fit jeans, not skinny. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Slim. And comfortable shoes. But whatever they said is what I'm saying. I was so zealous for God, just wanted to please God. I didn't care. Man, you want me to wear a suit, I wear a suit. You want me to usher, I'll usher. You want me to clean the bathrooms, I'll clean the bathrooms. You want me, whatever it took. And then what happens to a lot of us is we, we're on fire, then we start whining and complaining over not spiritual things, natural things. That's when you know, man, you better check your spiritual life because now you're caught up with the pettiness of life, not to the reality of their souls in the balance. And isn't it sad for someone that doesn't know God to come into the house of God and all they hear is this? Because you don't know who's listening to you. And then they think, man, if they don't like it, why would I? I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be that guy when I go to heaven and say, that guy right there would have been, that, that he's in hell now, he would have went to heaven had you not whined and complained. But see, we don't, we don't want to talk about this because we don't want to talk about our spiritual lives. Some of you will work out or whatever four or five times a week. It's in your schedule. You won't, you won't deviate from it or you have a schedule and you're doing something. But what do we do spiritually? There was a time, man, when I would read the Word and I wanted to know the Bible. So the pastor said, you got to read this book. And I'm like, okay. And I would do reports and he would look them over. I just wanted to learn. The, the issue is, is when did we get to a place where it's not that exciting? We should still be like, I'm saved. You know what? We should, as we grow and mature, we should be more grateful because we know now how bad we were, that we couldn't get it done on our own. So this, this attitude about being spiritually slothful is huge, and, and if we're not careful, we'll be tempted to be that way. We get caught up in the mundane. It's mon oh, I go to church, I do this, I do that. Or we don't do anything. Listen, if you're going to be a Christian, you got to do Christian acts. you got to serve. You need to give. You need to, you need to be involved somewhere in the house of God. Will I show up? That's not involvement. That's, that's attending. And I'm glad you're here. But, man, this is, a, this is one that we so many. How many of us say, Pastor, I'll be honest, I've been tempted to be spiritually slothful. I'm going to raise my hand. I don't think God would ever call me lazy. But he would call me, I think, at times slothful. There was a time when we came to church and we got so much out of the messages. Then as the pastor would push us to new levels, to achieve, to do more, we get this feeling like we can't keep up. We feel sluggish just thinking about it at all. So now we're not learning. We can't stay focused. And then we start saying, well, I'm not getting fed anymore. Folks, I, I'm going to tell you something. I've never said that because I've always gone to churches that preach the gospel. And today we live in a society where a lot of people don't preach anything that matters. And they're lulling people into this dull, monotonous form of Christianity that's not healthy. The happiest Christians, I've said this, are the ones who are involved doing something. They get to know people. They get involved. That's why we push you. That's why it's my responsibility to push you, if you would, to go to the next level. Whatever the next level is, you got to go there. But if we're not careful, we're spiritually slothful, we'll begin to push back. We won't, we won't be as engaged. I don't know how many times my wife and I went to church on the move and and, man, we'd go there and we'd be discussing something, not in a bad way, but discussing something. And all of a sudden, as Pastor George is preaching, not even about his message, he would start talking about something. And we'd look at each other and say, that's the answer. God's given us our answers. Yeah. How many of you have had this happen to you? You're like, you get answers. 
I don't know how many people walked up to me and said, you know, Pastor Steve, the message you taught, I was, we were just talking about that same subject today. The Spirit of God knows. But if you're sluggish and you're slothful, man, and you're boring and, and, and church is boring, church should never be boring. I love church. Now, I get it. Some of you come from work, and this is the first time you sit down all day. I've been that guy. That's why I ushered. I'd say, always put me in the top because then I could move because my body would be like, sleep. And I'm like, no, I need to listen. I want to pay attention. I want to learn because God's going to talk to me. We got to come in with that attitude that, God, please speak to my life today. God, I, I need to hear from you. There was a time when it was so passionate for so many, and now it becomes mundane, the norm. See, for most of us, it's our spiritual diet. We want only milk, but our body has grown, and our life has grown, and now we need some meat. I'm bugged when I see 30-year-olds still on, you know, on the bottle. Some of y'all know what I was wanting to say. So if I went out to dinner with you and we went to eat steak or something, and you said, no, I'm good, I don't need to order, and you pulled out your bottom, that would be the last time I'd eat with you. I'd be like, dude, something's wrong. You need help. <laughs> Sucking on some bottle like a baby with your depends on. I don't know. <laughs> but your body's craving. You're older. You got to get some more nourishment. Your body begins to crave more than milk. And for a lot of us, spiritually, that's where we're at. It's time to get weaned. And it's time to get in some real meat and mature. And the reason you're sluggish and bored and it's like, oh, my God, here we got to go to church again. And, and you're not so zealous for the things of God. You're not passionate about man. There's people lost going to hell. There's hundreds of thousands of them we want to reach. But we get caught up in the pettiness. Because we're slothful. Thank God for this church. Thank God for this church. Anybody get anything out of this? All right. Let me hurry up and close. Hebrews 5, 13 and 14 reads, For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. See, at times, we'll go to work out three or four times a week, build our bodies, eat right, but spiritually, it's one week or one meal, 30 minutes a week, and we're good. 1 Timothy 4, 8, the Apostle Paul says, physical training is good, so it's good to stay in shape. But training for godliness is much better. Promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. Working out your physical bodies, eating right, will give you some profit, benefit in this life, but not the life to come. You have to train in godliness. That means there's training involved. That means there's work. That means there's sacrifice. That means, that it, 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 and, and what it does when you're willing to do it, it keeps you alive. I don't know that I've ever lost my passion for the lost from the day I got saved. I don't, I, 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 maybe God knows, but I don't think so. I've always had a heart for the lost. I've always loved the church. I've always wanted to be in church. I like when we have guest speakers. Some of you don't, but I do, because I get to sit and learn too. I take, I take notes. Anybody who knows me know I take notes because I want to learn, and I like their perspectives. In fact, in October, we're going to bring back Diego Mesa. Anybody know him? And then in November, we're bringing back Bishop Dale Bronner. How many of y'all remember him? Let me tell you what's ironic about those two. Bishop Dale Bronner shows up here, and he speaks fluent Spanish, reads, writes it, speaks it. He spoke Spanish to this church. This church went crazy. I tell Diego Mesa when he comes, I say, hey, brother, man, if you'll speak a little Spanish to our people, you'll have them, man. They'll be loving you. And he looked at me and goes, so what do you think? Just because I'm Spanish, I speak Spanish? He said, are you profiling me? That's what he said to me. I said, yes, I am, dude. Your name is Diego Mesa. Speak some Spanish. And he looked at me and laughed. And he goes, I don't speak no Spanish. And I said, only at Legacy Church will we bring a brother in that speaks fluent Spanish. And we bring a Latino in, and he speaks nothing. 
I don't get it. See, here's the reality. None of us will ever know all there is to know about God. You cannot run out of things to learn. And you always seek to move ahead, move forward. That's the whole goal. That's the next step. What is your next level? What is the next thing in your life? And people come for counseling too. It bugs me. They'll come and you'll give them, they'll say, hey, I have this question. You start giving them an answer and they'll say, I know that. I know what the Bible says. I said, then why are you asking? Just go do it. You know, it's funny. When people come and ask you questions, it's not, we don't care what you know. You're asking us what we know. So I'm just telling you as a pastor now, I've been doing this a long time, when people come up and say, hey, pastor, what do you think about this? And I'm like, well, I think they say, well, I know that. I just want to look at them like anymore and just look at them and say, okay, fine, I'm done. I'm, I'm through talking to you. If you know everything, can I tell you something? If you know everything, why are you asking? And some people know the Bible, but they don't know the author and the reality of it. They, they have some knowledge, but it doesn't, it doesn't equate to action. Folks, quit being around people who say they know the Bible. They're not doing anything. (laughs) What are they good for? Well, I know the Word. Well, do the Word. I don't care how much you know. I want to see what you know. Jeremiah 29, 13. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. If you seek God with all your heart, you will find him. That means stay passionate, stay fired up, stay fueled. It's okay to get, you know what I love about our worship and other pastors they come to? They say, man, there's clapping, there's whistling. I said, yeah, and it's the chicks in the room. The girls in the room are whistling. Let me hear one of you ladies whistle. Look at that, baby. They're whistling at me, man, right there. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) But what I'm saying is it's okay to have some enthusiasm when it comes to the Word of God and the the love of God. And and you have to ask yourself, what is your next level? If slothfulness has become part of your life, it can be corrected. Don't stay in neutral. Just repent and say, God, forgive me, and get back and watch God put that flame, and it'll burn brighter and brighter like it once did. In Matthew 25, it talks about the the master that gave the talents. To the one five, he gave five. The one two, he gave two. And the one one, he gave one. And and, and the one that had five got more, five more. And he said, well done, that good and faithful servant. And the one that had two got two more. He said, well done, that good and faithful servant. But the one who had one hid it. And here's what the master knew. Or here's what he knew about the master. This master would accept no excuses for a lack of increase. It didn't matter how difficult the situation. Are you listening to me, Christian? This is our God. It doesn't matter how difficult the situation, how many odds were against his servants, or how impossible it seemed, the master still expected increase. His servants understood that there, there was, this was his expectation of them. Thus, the servant who did nothing with his talent found himself in a horrible predicament. The Bible says, you wicked and slothful servant. It's a person who has a do-nothing, lethargic, lack, lackadaisical, apathetic, indifferent, lukewarm attitude towards God and life. And folks, that's not the fruit of the Christian. We should be fired up. We should be excited. We should have some passion. We should have some wisdom. And we should never forget what God did for us on that cross when he died for you and I and gave us eternal life. That's why we stay excited. So if you want to repent, it's time to repent and say, God, forgive me for ever being slothful in my walk with you. Or maybe you've always been slothful. Does anybody remind, did did anybody see themselves when I was talking about when you first got saved, man, you were like fired up. I see people when they first get saved, people always go, Christians, you know, they're going to be evangelists. I said, why? They're bringing everybody to church. I said, yeah, because that's all they know is sinners. (laughs) But we want to put the label, you're going to be an evangelist, you're going to be an evangelist. And after a year, we forget that there's sinners still out there. And then they don't bring as many. 
We still got to invite people. I'm just going to tell you as the pastor of this church and my wife, we, we still invite people. They need God. My heart breaks when people miss heaven. It saddens me to think that. So you and I have to decide. You have to decide for yourself. Are you going to tell God, let's turn that flame back up, man. I'm going to get back involved. I'm going to, I'm going to do whatever it takes, God. I just want more of you. Are we going to let back and let it just keep flickering a little bit every now and then? Just so people know you're still alive. It's your call. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for being here. I thank you for teaching us all. I thank you, God, that if we've been tempted to be slothful, maybe, maybe we all have, I don't know, that, God, you would cause that flame to burn brighter, that passion to come back, that zeal for you and the things of God to replace being disinterested and lethargic and apathetic and indifferent and what does it matter anyway, attitude, lackadaisical. That, God, you'd cause all of our flames to burn so bright with zeal and wisdom and enthusiasm. When we come into the house of God, we'll leave and say, oh, my goodness, he just spoke to me. Who is he? God. God just spoke to me and reminded me of my life. So, God, what is the next level? What is the next step for me to move forward, to stretch, to grow, to develop? I've been lifting the same old five pounds my whole life. And, God, I've always wondered why I'm not bigger, why my guns aren't even BB guns. God said, man, you got to pick up a little bit more weight. got to take a little bit more responsibility. That's all it takes. If you'll pray this prayer with me, if this is you, with every head bowed, if you'd pray, Father, if this, if this is you, if you're in that spirit of slumber and slothfulness, you say, Pastor, I'm not lazy. i got to work, and I work hard. I know. But if we're spiritually lazy, it's called slothfulness. So if that's you, you pray this with me. Father, I pray, and I ask you to forgive me for ever being slothful. I thank you now that you forgive me. And I ask you to turn up the flame. Make it brighter. Make it burn hotter. Give me back my passion, my zeal. And I thank you, God, my convictions. And I thank you, Lord. I'll do whatever's next. I'll take the step. To be, to be active, to do what I'm supposed to do as a believer. And I thank you, Father, for forgiving me and helping me in Jesus' name. Now listen to me. If you're here with every head bowed and you say, Pastor, I've walked with God, but I've walked away. My flame's not even flickering, Pastor. It went out. Would you pray with me to come home? Because I do want to get it right. And you're right. I... Even when you were talking, I saw the progression in my life. But it's time for me to get it right. Or you're here and you say, Pastor, I've never accepted God into my life. I've never given God permission to me with my thought or intent to follow him, to learn what he, what he has to say, to learn his ways. But I want that. If that's you in Jesus' name, wherever you're seated, I'm not going to call you forward, but I'm going to pray with you at your seat. I'm going to ask you to do something. And when I ask you to do this, if one will do it, I believe everyone in this room will do it. It's not hard, but the Bible says that if I confess God before man, that Jesus will confess me before my Father. And all I'm going to ask you to do in that confession is to take a stand for God. Say, I don't care what anybody else thinks. I just want to get right. If that's you in Jesus' name, right where you're seated, here's what it is. I just want you to stand right at your seat. Just remain standing. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. I'm going to pray for you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, this couple of you. God bless you guys. Who else? As I look across the church, so many just stood. Thank you at the top. As I look across, just remain standing. I'm going to pray for you. As I look across the top, who else will join these? So many of these people just stood up quickly. You know why? Because they want God. Thank you, sweetie. Who else would join them? Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. These guys over here. 
God bless you, ma'am. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. It doesn't take much. Just stand. It's a few inches. God bless you, this couple at the top. Thank you, ma'am. God bless you. God loves you. This is a miracle right here. You don't realize it. Who else would join? This is your moment to really receive the God that created all of us and will give you purpose. Thank you, this couple right here. God bless you. Man, this is, churches don't have this. I'm telling you, some churches don't have one person saved in a year. Who else would join? Today is the day of salvation for whoever. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, young man. I see you back there. Father, in the powerful, thank you. In the powerful name of Jesus, thank you, sir. In the powerful name of Jesus, thank you, sir. I lift up all these folks to you, God. I'm so honored and blessed because now I know, Holy Spirit, you were really here with all of us. Because no one comes to you unless you draw them by your Spirit. We're so grateful to be a part of this, God, to serve you in this capacity. Thank you for blessing these folks like they've never been blessed before. That you're going to turn that flame. You're going to turn it on. It's going to be bright. And Father, they're going to know it's never going to be extinguished. It's always going to burn. And for those that are, have never asked you really to be Lord of their life with the intent to follow you and serve you, today their life's going to be so different. And they're going to, they're going to even feel different, God. And they're going to start having different desires. And they're going to start thinking about you a lot more than they ever have because you're going to live in them. And then they're going to do what Christians do in Jesus' name. If you're standing, I want you to pray this prayer loud with me. I want everybody in this room in support of those standing to pray this prayer so no one's praying alone. Guys, we're going to pray with you in support of you. Would you pray this with me? Would you pray, Father, I believe in Jesus. And I believe He is your Son. And I believe He is Lord of all. Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, be Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. I believe I'm yours. Thank you for the passion, the zeal, the conviction that I'll never be in neutral. I'll be speeding forward with you my whole life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Let's thank God for all these folks. Wow. Wow.